Well, good morning. I've missed you. <laughs> I've missed the pulpit. I've missed the preaching of the Word of God. Um, so it brings me great gladness to say to you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of Acts. Uh, this morning we are in chapter 8, and we'll be looking at verses 26 to 40. Acts 8, 26 to 40. And if you could please ask the congregation to stand for the reading of the Word of God, if you are able to do so. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And behold, there was an Ethiopian, an eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and now he was returning back home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear, it's silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he, as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this salvation that you brought to this Ethiopian. And we thank you that you have preserved this scripture uh, down through the ages and have even seen to it that it's been translated into English, uh, also French, that we would be able to read it and understand it in our mother tongue. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit now, you would help us to see and understand and not just the meaning, but the significance of this passage especially as we think about how you've saved us and how you have saved the baptism candidates that will soon be uh, placed in water and brought up out of the water. Um, help us to see and understand that we would rejoice in you, the God of salvation, this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we will baptize nine individuals. That's amazing. For a small church like this, it's amazing. Um, we'll baptize nine individuals whom God has saved by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Five of the nine are from the exact same household. Jared, Faith, Everett, Clark, and Grace. Salvation has come to the Hamilton residence. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We'll also baptize Ethan. He made it. I know uh, last night was kind of hectic, <laughs> but he's here, so praise God. And Frank is going to be baptized, and Leona. And uh, we'll also baptize my own daughter, Hannah, which makes this an extra special morning for me too. Um, so to prepare our hearts for these baptisms, I want to invite you to enter with me into this true story. In the second half of Acts chapter 8, about the man whom we know today as simply the Ethiopian eunuch who was saved and then baptized. 
Uh, Much has been said and written, much could be said today about this true story, what it says, what it means. However, in this shorter sermon, all I want to try to do this morning is simply draw out of the text three truths about the salvation of the Ethiopian eunuch that are also true of you if you've been saved. And these three truths are true as well for our nine baptism candidates. So the first truth is this. Your salvation was God-directed. And what I mean by this is that if you've been saved, it's because God has saved you. God planned your salvation. God initiated your salvation. God brought you to salvation. Salvation is all by God and through God so that all the glory goes to God. Although we see this throughout this passage, it's perhaps most visibly on display in verses 26 to 31. So picking it up in verse 26, we read this. Amazing. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, not the apostle, but the evangelist, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And Luke, who's the author of this book, adds, this is a desert place. And Philip rose and he went. Do you see how God directed the Ethiopian salvation is? A holy angel, a messenger dispatched by the Lord in heaven, appears to Philip and directs Philip with an audible and clear command to travel towards the place where he will encounter the Ethiopian. In addition to this, God directs the salvation of the Ethiopian through Philip's obedience. God has already been at work in Philip's life to save and to sanctify him so that by this point, he's a man of good repute. He's a man full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom who loves Jesus and his gospel and who is inclined to go wherever the Lord directs him, even if it's, a t- even if it's a to a desert place for an undisclosed reason. And I wonder if you're saved, is it in part because the Lord brought a Philip into your life? Or maybe two Philips or several Philips? If so, then praise the Lord. How else does the Lord direct the Ethiopian salvation? Picking it up in the middle of verse 27, we read this, and... Behold, there was an Ethiopian, an eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, amazingly, and he was now returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. In these two verses, do you see how God directed the Ethiopian salvation is? Well before that moment when God saved him, God had been slowly tilling the soil of his heart to prepare it to receive the seed of the gospel of Christ. Evidently, this Ethiopian was unsatisfied with the gods of his culture and with the idols fashioned by the hands of men. Evidently, this Ethiopian even desired to worship the God of Israel, so much so that when an opportunity arose to make the five-month dangerous journey from Ethiopia, south of Egypt, all the way up to Jerusalem, he took it. And evidently, this Ethiopian desired even to read the word of God, so much so that he acquired a scroll of the prophet Isaiah, no doubt at great financial cost. God was tilling the soil of this man's heart. And I wonder, how did God till your heart to receive the seed of the gospel? What or whom did the Lord God bring into your life to make you ready to believe the gospel? Maybe you're not saved here this morning and God is tilling the soil of your heart even today as you hear the word of God preached. Praise him for that. How else does the Lord direct the Ethiopian salvation? Picking it up in verse 29, we read, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him. 
and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And so he invites Philip to come up and sit with him. Wow, do you see how God directed this is? We see God, the Holy Spirit, directing Philip, not with a vague feeling (laughs) or impression, but with an audible and clear command, which is very unusual. And again, we see the Lord directing the salvation of the Ethiopian salvation. Uh, Pardon me, the Lord directing the salvation of the Ethiopian through Philip's obedience. Philip obeys the Spirit, the Spirit immediately, because he loves Jesus, he loves the gospel, and Philip wants to help the unsaved to understand the word of God so that they're saved by God for the glory of God. And you know, isn't it amazing that providentially Philip is there with the Ethiopian in a desert place at just the right time when Isaiah is being read aloud and the Ethiopian is puzzled and Philip is able to explain the text And if you're saved, it's because God put you in the right place at the right time to hear the word of God and probably someone to explain the word of God to you that you now believe. And if so, praise the Lord. The second truth we see in this passage about our salvation and that of the Ethiopian is this. Your salvation was gospel-produced. And what I mean by this is that God saved you by means of or by the agency of the good news concerning the person and the work of Christ Jesus. We see this in verses 32 to 35. Picking it up in verse 32, we read this. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. If you had been Philip, would you have known where this passage is? Would you have been able to explain it? Philip knows where the passage is located in your Bible. It's found in Isaiah 53. Philip also knows what it means and how to explain it. He was ready. But the Ethiopian has no idea. Picking it up in verse 34, we read, And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself? Is it about Isaiah? Or is it about someone else? The Ethiopian is unable to make sense of this passage, so he asks Philip for help to explain it. And so, what a golden opportunity for evangelism. Don't you wish it was always set up like this? Philip sees the fastball coming at him, and he swings, and he hits that ball right out of the park. We're told, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this passage, this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. No doubt Philip explains that the passage refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was unjustly crucified. But this is only where Philip begins. Certainly, he unpacks the earlier part of Isaiah 53, where it is written that all we like sheep have gone astray. We all are guilty of sin and therefore deserve the penalty of death. But Philip also shares the good news of what Jesus accomplished through his unjust crucifixion. On the cross, Isaiah 53 tells us, God the Father laid on Jesus, our substitutionary lamb, the iniquity of us all. And for that iniquity, Jesus was stricken and smitten by God and crushed to death. Jesus suffered once for all, the just for the unjust, and he has been raised and ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God, and all of this he did to heal us and bring us peace with God. And also Philip must have said that anyone who turns away from sin and trusts in this Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins will be saved. Indeed, the Ethiopian did this, and so God saved him through the gospel. 
And if God has saved you, he did it through the same gospel of Jesus, which you have received. And if so, then praise the Lord. And the third and final truth we see in this passage that I want to draw our attention to this morning about our salvation and the salvation of the Ethiopian is this. Your salvation was heart transformative. And what I mean by this is that the moment, the instant God saved you through the power of the gospel, God performed a heart surgery on you. He took out of your heart, uh, he took out of you your heart of stone, and he gave you a heart of flesh. In the rest of our passage, we see evidence of the fact that this is what God did to the Ethiopian. Picking it up in verse 36, we read this, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, well, see, here is water. (laughs) What prevents me from being baptized? It's a great question for uh, churches to ask. You're saved. It prevents me from being baptized. And so the eunuch commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So having witnessed the Ethiopian saving faith in Jesus, Philip must have explained that Jesus commands his disciples to be baptized. And what we see here is the hasty, unhesitant obedience of the Ethiopian to Jesus. This is the fruit of genuine salvation. On the way to Jerusalem, the master of the Ethiopian's heart was sin. He loved sin. He was living in sin. He was living for sin, his master. But now on the way back home to Ethiopia, the master of his heart is now Jesus. He now loves Jesus. He now lives in Jesus. He lives for Jesus. And the same is true of each of our baptism candidates this morning. And the same is true of each of you who have been saved. In our passage, there's another evidence of a transformed heart in the Ethiopian. We see it in verse 39. Picking it up there, we read this. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way. Doing what? Rejoicing. He's rejoicing. I I imagine the chariot stopped again, and he's like jumping with joy around the chariot. (laughs) That's what I might have done. (laughs) If you've been saved, you know this joy. He feels the kind of inexpressible joy that is spirit-given and Christ-centered and God-glorifying. He experiences the joy of God. He experiences Joy in God. And if you've been saved, you know this joy. For us who have been saved, how can we not rejoice as we think about how God has saved us? And later on this morning, as each of our nine baptism candidates, our brothers and sisters in Christ, come up out of the water, how can we not rejoice? Not in them, but in God and what he has done through them for his glory. How can we not rejoice? The saved are those who are once spiritually blind, but who can now see the glory of God in the face of Christ. The saved are those who are once estranged from God, but now who are reconciled to God. They are those who are once enslaved to sin, but who are now enslaved to God, Romans 6. They are those who are once in the domain of darkness following the devil, but now are, now are in the kingdom of God following the light of the world, which is Christ. The saved are those who were once dead in sin, but who are now alive in Christ. What a transformation. How can we not rejoice? And this incredible transformation is precisely what baptism pictures. Baptism by immersion in water cannot save anyone. Instead, it's a visual representation of what has already happened spiritually in a person whom the Lord has saved. When our nine brothers and sisters in Christ go down into the water, that'll be a picture of how before Jesus entered their lives, they were spiritually dead in sin, under the wrath and judgment of God and separated from the life that is in God. 
But when they are raised up out of the water, that'll be a picture of how God has saved them from their deadness and from the curse of the grave. Coming up out of the water will point back to that moment in time when God, through his gospel, raised them from death to life spiritually. And it'll also point forward to that future moment when God will raise them from the dead physically, unless the Lord returns first, before they die. And when they emerge from the water, it'll also represent the cleansing of all their sin through faith in Jesus. And it'll represent that the old life of rebellion against God has been left behind, and the new life of obedience to God out of love for him has come. And for these reasons, we will rejoice. Love to invite our baptism candidates to come on up. Come on up here, all together. And I want to ask you a few questions just to affirm before the congregation your faith in Jesus. Um, and then we'll go from there. So come on up. So Ethan, Leona, Frank, Jared, Clark, Everett, Grace, and Hannah. Come on over here, Frank, and we'll start the line here. <clears throat> so, is Everett here? Okay, so Everett and Jared and Clark will meet us at the pool. They're going to get there first. <laughs> they might be in the pool already. <laughs> I'm joking. So question number one. They've seen these questions. They know the answer. <laughs> and I know you believe this. So do you believe in the God of the Bible who exists as one being, yet three persons, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, who are co-equal, co-eternal, who are all-powerful, all-present, and know all things. Do you believe in this God? If you do, I invite you to say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Amen. And do you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived the sinless life, who died on the cross, who was buried and was resurrected from the dead, who ascended to the right hand of God the Father, that you have repented from your sin and you have placed your faith in him. If you have, I, I invite you to say, yes, I have. And do you desire today to be baptized in obedience to your Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Praise God. So I think, uh, do any of you want to share a testimony? I know Leona was, wants to. Um, if not, I invite you to sit back down and Leona can come on over. And uh, you can use the pulpit mic here, Leona, if you like. And I'll, I'll sit right here in case you, something happens and you need me. <laughs> Just so you're really comforted and I'll sit right here. I can even catch you if I need to. <laughs> yeah. And I'll move it down for you. My name is Leona Horner, and this is my testimony. Today I will be baptized. I was raised as an Anglin. I was baptized as a baby and confirmed as a young girl. In 1999, I thought that I was saved and that I had received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But it wasn't until later that I realized something was missing. Once I started coming to Grace Community Bible Church, I was searching, listening, and observed. I saw how caring and loving the church is. I experienced how much people cared about me because they are true Christians. And I saw how much love our new minister and his family have for Jesus and cares for the church and loves to preach the word. Now I want Jesus Christ to be first in my life. I'm devoted to him. I would follow Jesus Christ even if 
doing so costs me my life. Jesus Christ has changed me and is changing me. I feel the happiest in this church. I feel the presence of God. I feel peace when I am among my Christian friends. I am hungry to hear the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Excuse me. I want to come to church and Bible study when I am well. I want to love others like Jesus Christ and the church have loved me. Jesus Christ gives us his Holy Spirit to want to help out other people and care for other people. As Christians, we are supposed to show our love to other people. This is what really got my attention. How so many people in this church loves and cares about me. Our actions speak louder than our words. I have had so many blessings in my life since I have been coming to church on a regular basis. I want to thank each one of you for showing me the way to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and to our eternal home. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. I thank Jesus Christ for helping me find this wonderful church and true Christians. May God bless everyone. Loving Christ, Leona. <laughs>